host of today. I would very pleased to have Rachel Roberts from Washington University, who will be telling us about how to approximate foliation by convection. So thank you very much, Nathan, for the invitation. Um, uh, so my goal is to define the various terms that I use today. So please stop me if I've you know, used a term so often I forget that it's not one of the standard one. So we're going to be talking about foliations and we're going to be talking about contact structures and in particular at the end getting to a result or generalization of a result due to Eli Oshberg and Thurston which says that if you have um, sufficiently nice foliations you can approximate them by contact structures. So we'll be thinking about three manifolds and in general when I talk about a manifold I'm going to be assuming that it's connected that it's closed, that it's oriented, and that it's smooth, a three-dimensional manifold, except every so often I won't. I mean, every so often we'll have a non-compact manifold or we'll have a manifold with non-empty boundary. But if we have non-empty boundary, it's always going to be just a union of tori. And thanks to Ries, we know that any three-manifold admits a unique smooth structure up to diffeomorphism. Um, so it's sufficient when I give descriptions to just describe the manifold topologically. And you know, some baby examples of three manifolds, we could think about S3, so we could think about uh, the unit three-dimensional sphere. We could think about taking a product of one manifold S1 with two manifold S2, or in general, S1 cross any closed surface. And thanks to Myers, we know that we actually don't have to stretch our imaginations that much further to imagine any possible three manifold. Um, because what he tells us is that if I give you a closed, connected, oriented three manifold, inside here, so any modulo those adjectives at the top there in red, um, that in there I can find a fibered knot. So there's an embedded circle so that if I look at m minus the neighborhood of this knot, of this embedded circle, what I have is just a once punctured compact surface cross 0, 1 glued by some monodromy map field. So if as soon as we removed our fibered knot, we just have, well, whatever genus single puncture, and then glued by some phi. And you know, then you could say, oh, well, three manifolds can't be that interesting. But of course, there are infinitely many such descriptions for any three manifold. And so mm -hmm. it's tricky to use this really to grab hold of them in lots of ways. OK, so our world is the world of three manifolds, oriented compact three manifolds. And we're going to be thinking about two plane fields on these manifolds. So you think about standing at any point in your manifold, and you've got associated a little two plane. So you've got a two plane field. If you're thinking about continuity or smoothness, you can just think about you've got a sub bundle of the tangent bundle. And <coughs> but let's just think very much just in terms of pictures. So I've got, I'm standing at a point. I have a plane. I could instead think about describing my plane by thinking about a little normal to my plane at each point. And I can formalize that by saying, OK, my two-plane field is the kernel of some differential one form, alpha. And so locally, here are two examples of two-plane fields that we might be interested in. The first one is particularly easy. I can, so locally, I'm a three-manifold, so locally I'm R3. And I'm thinking I've chosen coordinates so that locally my little two-plane field is just given by the kernel of dz. So dz, I'm thinking about my little normal pointing vertically in the direction of the z-axis. And so I'm thinking about my two-plane field is just at each point I've got an associated the horizontal plane. And the second one is a little bit more complicated, but not too much. So again, we're just thinking we've got local coordinates x, y, z. And now we're thinking about our two-plane field 
is the kernel of a one form, and my one form just looks like dz plus x dy. So we can look at this one form and we can say, oh, let's see, it's invariant under translation by z. It's just dz plus x dy. It's invariant under translation by y. So I completely understand it if I understand what my two-plane field looks like as I move along the x-axis. I then get my two-plane field everywhere by just translating around my R3. And if you think a little bit about what the planes are doing along the x-axis, well, if we look at x equals 0, we just have dz, so we've just got a horizontal plane. And then if we thought about it a little more, we would see that um, as we move into negative x, where our two planes are, are beginning to tip like this. As I move to positive x out of the board, my two planes are tipping like this. I never get to vertical, but as my x goes to plus or minus infinity, the two planes get closer and closer to being um, vertical two planes. So you can visualize both of those examples very carefully. And a quick computation shows you that in the first case, if you do alpha win, 1 wedge d alpha 1, you just have 0. And if you do alpha wedge um, ha, alpha 2 wedge d alpha 2 in the second one, it's going to be everywhere positive. It's just going to be standard volume form on R3. OK, so I, I began saying just picture any two-plane field. But we're actually interested in one of three possible two-plane fields. And the first is that locally it looks like the first example we had on the previous board. So if um, our two-plane field looks like kernel of alpha, and we know that alpha wedge d alpha is identically 0, then we're in the situation which is called completely integrable. We have this two-plane field, and we can just integrate it to get a decomposition of our manifold into surfaces. So we've got a decomposition of our manifold into surfaces. Um, we've got what's known as a foliation. And that means that I've got a decomposition of my manifold into surfaces so that locally I, things look very tame. I've just got R2 cross R. They just look like um, horizontal pieces of surface. We, so what you say is you've got a foliation atlas. You've got a cover of your manifold by neighborhoods that look like this. And if you think about the little planes in each of the R2 cross Rs, those glue together nicely to give a decomposition of your manifold into surfaces. The second type of example is locally we have the picture from the previous page. And either we have strictly positive or we have strictly negative. And we really, as long as we understand strictly positive, then we've got a symmetric picture and we're understanding st um, strictly negative. So this is the case that the two-plane field is maximally non-integrable. So that means you can't integrate. Even locally, you can't integrate to get your two-plane field as the um, tangent plane field of some surface. And if you think over in this example, that where we were thinking about the dz plus x dy, maybe that, that feels pretty much right. So we're interested in two-plane fields we're going to be interested in two-plane fields that either are the tangent plane fields or foliations, or two-plane fields which satisfy this alpha wedge d alpha greater than 0 condition, um, in which case we're thinking about contact structures. Locally, we understand what goes on completely. Locally, we can always choose coordinates so that if we're in the foliation case, we see the first case here. If we're in the contact structure case, we see the second. And Globally, if you want to understand um, lots of examples, well, I'm going to give you some boring foliation examples, but some interesting contact structure examples. So if I think about my manifold as just obtained by take a surface bundle and um, do, a d do a dense filling, so that's just say take my torus boundary and I, I, I fill in the I union on a solid torus so that I have a closed manifold. Examples of foliations are obtained in the following way. I can think about, so I've got this picture, union, I filled in a solid torus. So the solid torus 
is going to be just filled in as what's called a rape component. So you can think about, I've got a solid torus, so I've got a notion of meridian disk. I can think about, I've got a foliation by meridian disks, except I want to change this. I want to change to a foliation that has a single torus leaf and an S1's worth of o open R2 leaves. And the way I'm going to do that is just to think about taking this disk, but as I get near the boundary, I'm going to get closer and closer. I'm going to spiral around my torus leaf. And of course, I've got an S1's worth of such leaves. So this is an example of what's known as a rape component. But I can play this same spiral game with the fibration. I can think about I've got a foliation of this surface bundle by just compact surfaces, and I can instead replace this by a foliation with non-compact leaves that has the torus as a, as, a, as a limit leaf. And I can do that again by just taking this compact surface and then having it spiral on the outside now of this torus. So you can visualize a foliation. It turns out they're not so interesting um, for us because exactly because they contain these rape components. But if I give you any three manifold, you can see that any three manifold is going to contain one of these two plane fields, which is the tangent plane field of a foliation. I can also now, though, describe sort of interesting contact structures using this structure also. And so if I think maybe that's my foliation board, and here's my contact structure board, I'm going to think about redrawing my picture. So now this is, what did I call my fiber F? So now I'm thinking about I've got uh, S1's worth of fibers as I rotate around my boundary torus. And here I would have to give a little bit more detail, but you can think about there's a contact structure which is compatible with you know, the picture guaranteed by Meyer. And my contact structure looks, well, I told you it couldn't be a tangent plane field um, of a surface, but it's very close to being a tangent plane field um, at the fibers away from the solid torus. And then at the solid torus, I'm thinking about maybe in a collar neighborhood, I go from being very close to flat, and then I, then I start looking like this model I had along the copies of the x-axis where I'm thinking about, well, I'm lying to you because I've really now got a radially asymmetric local model. But there's some sort of similar idea in which I'm rotating through. And my contact structure is actually going to be transverse to the core of my, of my solid torus. So if you haven't thought about that, that was way too quick. But there's a, um, there's a way of sort of nicely visualizing um, lots of examples of and, and um, by Giroux, any contact structure can be visualized um, in this way. You can think about, I give you a contact structure, you st give yourself an open book that's compatible with the contact structure, and that tells you, can you visualize it exactly in the way that I was at least suggesting over there on the right-hand board. OK, so we're interested in three manifolds. We're interested in two plane fields on the three manifolds, and it was a beautiful insight of Eliasberg and Thurston that these two very different types of two-plane field, you know, one's completely integrable while the other is maximally non-integrable, are related in a really interesting way. So, you know, I have something which is greater than zero, something that's equal to zero. Maybe it's not such a huge leap to say, oh, well, let's combine them and I've got something greater than or equal to zero. But, I mean, it's, it's, it, the, the, the insight was that this was a really interesting thing to do. And so we're also interested in two-plane fields that satisfy alpha wedge d alpha greater than or equal to zero, and those are called confoliations. <coughs> we're going to be interested in smoothness properties of foliations. So if you think about a foliation, um, if you go back to the definition that I muttered under my breath that you have a uh, foliation atlas, then the standard definition of CR is that your foliation is CR if and only if you can find a CR foliation atlas. 
so that the change of coordinates that preserve the foliation are CR. When R is greater than or equal to 1, so that includes infinity, there's this theorem of Munkers that says, well, up to changing the smoothness structure on your manifold, that's equivalent to the tangent plane field being CR. And for today's talk, that's a much more useful way of thinking of things. So as long as R is greater than or equal to 1, uh, F is CR, if and only if T TF is CR, we're going to be in a situation where we need at least our tangent plane fields to be continuous. So we're going to add that condition. We're going to use as our definition that a foliation F is C0 if and only if its tangent plane field is C0. And there are arguments that could be made in favor of this definition, um, but in the interests of time, although I'm sort of very interested in that, I, I won't say anything more. So we're going to think about a foliation as CR if and only if the corresponding two-plane field is CR. And well, every manifold contains a foliation, we want to restrict attention to foliations that are topologically interesting. And so we're going to be thinking about foliations which are taut. And um, thanks to Sullivan, that we've got at least three different ways in which we can think about taut. So the first one is you've got this manifold, you've got this three manifold, you've got this decomposition into surfaces. And you're going to say that it's taut if every leaf admits a transversal. So if every leaf is um, intersects a simple closed curve that's everywhere transverse to the foliation. And that's equivalent to there existing a smooth volume preserving flow phi that is transverse to the foliation. And Sullivan gave a proof in the context of C infinity. Uh, Thurston and Schweitzer said there's actually a very nice, easy way to see this in terms of C0. And then, you know, jumping between volume preserving flows and smooth closed two forms is just some standard game. So you can think about, okay, either I've got a smooth closed two form that's positive when I evaluate it on, on um, the tangent plane field of a foliation, or I can think about I've got my two plane field and I can find a flow that's every way transverse to my two plane field, my tangent plane field of my foliation, um, and which is volume preserving. So depending on what you want to think about, any one of those three is nicer than the others. Sorry, what's that, sorry? In the last current convention, okay. where does the metric come in? Because you said there isn't in any metric, so then you don't say anything about it. I don't, but um, well, maybe, I, maybe implicitly here do. I mean, so, so the game is I, I want to have a Riemannian volume form, and then I, I can jump between the flow and the, um, the two form in this but way. Right, yeah, so in that, in that context. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if F is taut, then that tells me that my manifold doesn't contain something which is called a vanishing cycle. So a vanishing cycle um, in my manifold with my two-plane field, and the tendency is to be very sloppy. So um, when I talk about F, sometimes I'm really talking about TF, sometimes I'm talking about F, and I'm afraid I'm going to follow convention and, and not be careful. Um, but a vanishing cycle just means that I've got a leaf in my foliation, I've got a simple closed curve embedded in that leaf, and when I intersect my leaf with the foliation, or when I think about um, the, f the singular foliation induced on it by thinking about um, the intersection with the tangent plane field, I see this. I see a single point, and then I see circles. And here's the example where I see this. I can think about a rape component. I've got a simple closed curve. and um, if I see a vanishing cycle, Novikov tells me that I see this picture right here. So I think about if I intersected a disk with this picture, I would have uh, one leaf that was tangent, or one point at which we had tangency with the foliation, and then I would have nested, nested circles. And um, if I have a taut co-oriented foliation, then I know I have information about my manifold. I know that, um, I know by Rosenberg that 
my manifold is irreducible or else just S1 cross S2. So irreducible means any embedded S2 bounds a three ball. So if I have a taut correlated foliation, either every S2, if I see an S2, it must be that I'm just S1 cross S2. Um, by uh, Novikov, my fundamental group is infinite. By Palmera, my universal cover is R3. And by Ojvar Szabo, my manifold is not an L space. And I think L space is one of the things I'm not going to define, but I figure Nathan has talked about this a lot. OK, so I needed one adjective when I was talking about fo my foliations. I need a bunch of adjectives when I'm talking about contact structures. So a contact structure is tight. That's sort of the analog analogous property to tautness for foliations. If the, if the um, contact structure does not contain an overtwisted disk. So I could think vanishing cycle. I had a Legendrian curve. I had a curve that was um, tangent to the two-plane field. And then my disk intersected like this. An overtwisted disk is a Legendrian unknot, which is tangent to, um, w well, let me just say it this way. I'm going to see two-plane fields. Uh, two plane, so I'm going to have a disk. This is an overtwisted disk. I have an unknot. So I've got a simple closed curve bounding a disk in my manifold. It's going to be Legendrian. It's going to be tangent to my two-plane field. On uh, the, the unknot is going to be tangent. The, the, the disk bounded by the, the unknot is going to be tangent to the two-plane field of my contact structure, exactly at the boundary and at the center. And then it's just, just going to twist out radially as I move out. So the induced singular foliation on my disk in this case is this. So my contact structure is tight if I don't see any of these. I'm also going to be interested in contact structures which are weakly symplectically fillable. So if I have a three manifold, three manifold, but I can think boundary of a four manifold. So it's fillable. I'm thinking about I can fill it. There's a, it's the boundary of a four manifold. Weakly fillable means it's one of the boundary components of the four manifold. Weakly symplectically fillable is telling me that, OK, I have a symplectic manifold. And I look at the boundary components of my four manifold. One of, and they all admit positive contact structures, uh, such that the um, symplectic form is positive on these contact structures. And one of them has to be my M and my contact structure. So I start off with this contact manifold. I think about as a, as a three manifold, it's a boundary component of a four manifold. And if I think about the symplectic form, the symplectic form restricts to positive contact structures on all the boundary components, and in particular on pivot C on this, on this one contact structure that I'm thinking about. And another definition, universally tight. It's universally tight if its lift to the universal cover of M is tight. So you have this closed three manifold with a contact structure. You lift it up to, um, to M tilde, and you check whether there are any overtwisted disks in the universal cover. And this big, powerful theorem of Eliasberg and Gromov, which tells you that if you're weakly symplectically fillable, then you know that you're tight. <coughs> OK. so. Here's our first proof. So it's an elementary observation of Eliasberg and Thurston that um, you can rec one way of recognizing whether a contact structure is weakly symplectically fillable is to see if there's a nearby negative contact structure. So you can measure nearby as is there a, a volume-preserving flow which is transverse to both. So if you have this picture, if you have a positive contact structure, so remember that's alpha wedge d alpha greater than 0, and you have nearby a negative contact structure, so that's alpha wedge d alpha is less than 0, where nearby is measured by um, share a common volume-preserving transverse flow, then you know that your contact structure has to be weakly symplectically fillable. And so you're going to know that your contact structure, if what you're interested in is tightness, say, you're going to know that it's tight. And the proof is, you know, it's either something you have to think about or it's something that's trivial because you think about four manifolds a lot or similar things somehow. So you have your contact structure. It's the kernel of a one form. Um, 
you have a two form which is given, so you have a two form on your three manifold which is um, given by this expression here where A gives a volume form. You construct a four manifold by just taking a thickening of your three manifold. You can think about giving yourself a symplectic structure by just playing some standard game. So you, it's just some sort of standard game and as long as epsilon is small enough, you have a symplectic form and so you know that this thickening was a weak symplectic filling for psi plus and you notice the advantage of having the positive contact structure and the negative contact structure because if you think of putting an orientation on m cross minus one one, m cross one and m cross minus one are going to be m with opposite orientations. So if you want positive contact structure on each, you want to have a positive contact structure and a negative contact structure on the manifold that you began with. And um, let, let me let me skip this, but oh. okay. So the Eliasberg Thurston theorem from the early 90s uh, tells you that if you start with a taut oriented smooth foliation on a closed oriented three manifold, you need to rule out sort of the silly case that your S1 cross S2, or well, it's interesting in its own right and fails the conclusion. Um, then it can be C0 approximated by both a positive and a negative contact structure. And then by that little argument in the previous slide, the contact structures are going to be weakly symplectically fillable and universally tight um, pretty much for free. So highlighted in blue is sort of the meat of what's going on. Uh, well, not really, modulo the um, eliasberg gromov theorem, which is lurking also. Um, but so we're saying, okay, if we have a taut-oriented smooth foliation on a closed-oriented three-manifold, then we can get ourselves into this nice situation where we have a positive contact structure and a negative contact structure, which are nearby in the sense that they're transverse to a common volume-preserving flow. So the idea is I have this foliation, I, get a, I, I know because it's taut that there's a, a transverse volume-preserving flow, I find it psi plus, I find it psi minus, and then I'm set to go. So the trick is figuring out how to, how, to, how to do that. And they use very much the fact that the foliation is smooth. And a result um, due to Wilk uh, the, uh, joint with Will Cazes is that one can replace that C2 assumption with a C0 assumption where C0, we, we need to make sense of what it means to be close to the tangent plane field. So we need to have a tangent plane field at least C0. So we're using C0 foliation definition to mean tangent plane field is C0. So we're thinking about continuous foliations. And um, so, and recently Jonathan Bowden has obtained similar results um, and with uh, a different proof. Okay, so applications. So one of the uh, nice things that we can use a foliation to do is to show that the manifold is not an L space. And a lot of the foliations that are naturally constructed are actually not smooth. So, so that, was, that was our original motivation. We, we had foliations, the foliations were only C0, and we wanted it to apply uh, Ojvat Zabo, and we realize, uh oh, actually, we, we can't. So, if you want to use taut foliations, this res the, the result with Kazez says, okay, it's sufficient to find C0 foliations. Another motivator, although similar, is this notion of recognizing whether a contact structure is tight or not. So, a difficult problem in general is I give you a contact structure. And I want you to tell me whether it's tight or maybe universally tight or maybe weakly symplectically fillable. And that in general is, is pretty difficult. But if I give you a foliation, it's, it's almost always going to be trivial to decide whether or not it's taut. Um, so for example, um, if my foliation contains no torus leaf, I know it's going to be taut. So I can just, if I can rule out torus leaves, I'm, I'm, I'm golden. Um, I can have torus leaves and still be taut 
So really, I'm actually ruling out some more constrained things, something called dead end components. If I flow into a torus, if I was separating torus, or something, or a collection of tori that separate off dead end components, then I'm in trouble. So Honda Kazez and Matic used this observation um, a while ago to show that um, if you had a contact structure, so that the existence of a taut oriented foliation transverse, ah, this is a lot of words, okay. Um, so I have a manifold, if I give you any old three manifold, and I give you a contact structure on that three manifold, then I can visualize that contact structure by instead visualizing a compatible open book by Giroux. So compatible open book is this picture that at some point I had over on this board over here. I drill out a fibered knot, and then I have the pages of my open book or, or just the surfaces of my fibration. And then I've got this picture of the contact structure. Well, it's not exactly the tangent plane field, but it's pretty close. And then as I move near the, near the binding, near the torus, the, near the um, fibered knot that I removed, I, I completely understand what my contact structure looks like. So, I, so if you give me a contact structure, maybe I can go in and I can find an open book that's compatible with that contact structure and an open book for which there's also a very close, uh, there's a foliation that's very closely related to the fibration. So if you think about um, you've got a fibration, you've got the flow, the, you can think about fibration, you've, thanks to Thurston, you can think about um, either passing to periodic reducible or pseudo-anosic representatives, then you can think, so let's just think pseudo-anosic representative, you've got a transverse volume preserving flow. If you can find a foliation that's also transverse to that, you're all set. You can start um, applying um, eliasberg thurston So in words, existence of a taut oriented foliation transverse to the surgid suspension flow. Um, so we have the pseudo-anosic flow, but we have to extend it to the surgid manifold implies that the contact structure compatible with the open book is weakly symplectically fillable. When the binding is connected, this existence can be expressed cleanly in terms of the fractional Dane twist coefficient. So again, they were actually using foliations which were not necessarily smooth, so it fills a tiny gap. Okay, so back to the theorem. So we want to show that any taut oriented continuous foliation on a closed oriented three manifold can be C0 approximated by both a positive and a negative smooth contact structure. So really, of course, we're thinking the tangent plane field to the foliation can be C0 approximated by both a positive and a negative contact structure. So you begin with the foliation, and then you know that by tautness, there's a smooth transverse volume preserving flow. So you can picture your manifold, you can picture a decomposition of your manifold into surfaces, and then you've got a transverse volume preserving flow that's everywhere transverse to that. And the eliasberg thurston proof breaks down into two steps. So the first step is to say, introduce um, little pieces of, trans so you start with the foliation, start moving through the world of confoliations until at the end you have a contact, you have a pair of contact structure, well, positive confoliation leading to positive contact structure, negative confoliation leading to a negative contact structure. And the first step is to transform yourself to a confoliation that has finitely many contact pieces. And you have to use very much the structure of the foliation to get those contact pieces. And then the second part is to say, okay, using some sort of local thing that we're going to see on the slide in a moment. We've introduced this contact stuff. And then what we want is that we can flow along leaves of the foliation, or more generally, Legendrian curves, so curves that are tangent to the two-plane field that I have at each step, and get everywhere else in my manifold. And think about somehow the contact structure stuff radiating, radiating out. And whenever I've passed through and turned something contact, it forever after is going to stay contact. Okay, so I've got two steps, and I want to talk about each of those two steps a little bit more. Okay, so step one, I want to find enough good holonomy. And for Eliasberg and Thurston, um, they could weaken this a little bit, but not too much. Good means that 
we've got non, what's known as non-trivial linear holonomies. So here, what they need is the following. You need to find a leaf in your foliation. And you need to find a simple closed curve, uh, what I'm calling gamma in this picture. So you want to find a gamma so that in a neighborhood of gamma, the foliation has a particular type of behavior. So I can think about taking a transversal to my gamma and then moving along the leaf and seeing what happens to a little transverse annular neighborhood of my gamma. So I think about taking a little annulus that contains gamma as its core and which is everywhere transverse to my foliation. And I, so that's going to give me a map or it's going to give me, um, if I pass through a small enough interval, it's going to be, give me a map that takes me from my interval and then back around, you know, into some, you know, possibly bigger interval, but so that there's overlap. So non-trivial linear holonomy means the following. I need to have, as I move around gamma, either attracting behavior on both sides or repelling behavior on both sides. And of course, depending on how I orient gamma, I can think of it as attracting or repelling. So here I notice that as I move around gamma, if I think about a little vertical annulus, nearby leaves, this picture is meant to suggest that all nearby leaves wrap around and just spiral. Wrap, get attracted closer and closer and spiral. And you say that you've got non-trivial linear holonomy if not only do you, um, so non-trivial holonomy, you meaning it doesn't just, your, your first return map doesn't just act as the identity. Non-trivial linear means it doesn't even, uh, up to the first derivative, act as the identity. And so, well, I can orient so that I'm either greater one or less than one. Here I've, I'm choosing to orient things so that non-trivial linear holonomy corresponds to the first derivative being strictly less than one, so not equal to one. <coughs> so if you have this picture, if you have a, a simple closed curve in the leaf of the foliation so that um, the derivative, first derivative of my holonomy map is not equal to one, then that means that you're in a good situation for creating a contact region, a solid torus contact region around as a neighborhood of this simple closed curve gamma. And if you see two, uh, there's a result of Sackstetter that tells you that you see this a lot. So if I give you a foliation, I can um, think about my foliation containing a finite number of minimal sets. And Sachs data tells you that any minimal set contains a region like this. So if I give you a foliation, I can say, OK, look at a leaf of the foliation. So, sorry, I'm about to define minimal set. So I give you a foliation. I can give you a leaf of the foliation. And I can say, take the closure of that leaf. So remember, in general, that leaf is a non-compact leaf surface in, um, locally embedded, so immersed in a nice way in my compact manifold. And so. Um, I can think about its closure, and I can ask if that closure contains any other, properly contains any other leaf closures. If it doesn't, then it's minimal. It doesn't contain any smaller um, F-saturated set. So if you think about this game that I outlined a few minutes ago, you need to find finitely many contact pieces, and then you need to be able to move from any of one of these finite pieces anywhere else in your manifold, you would like finding contact pieces um, con see which see every minimal set is going to be sufficient. Because anything that's not part of a minimal set is going to limit on a minimal set. So as long as you have enough smoothness, then you have this sort of holonomy. And for reasons that I won't get into, you can, you can give yourself a contact structure on a solid torus neighborhood of the gamma. But if you see zero, then Sachs data fails. There's nothing at all that's telling you that you have to have the, this nice non-trivial linear holonomy. And in fact, 
you can have minimal sets where you're going to see no holonomy at all, or no non-trivial holonomy. Um, but there's a construction due to Donjua that tells you that if you take a leaf of a foliation, you can blow it up. You can replace it by, um, well, depending on what you want to do, you can take the leaf and you can replace it by a thickening of that leaf. And that's called a uh, donjois blow up. Um, and you can also, in that thickening, introduce holonomy. So instead of having a product foliation on that thickening, you can introduce um, spiraling in various ways. So if you see zero, um, you don't have Sachstetter, but you're also not scared of donjois blow up because donjois blow up isn't a nice smooth thing. So if you're trying to stay smooth, you can't do this. Um, but if you just care about continuity, you're fine. And you can do blow up and you can introduce holonomy, non-trivial holonomy around simple closed curves. Um, and so all that we need to see to be able to get started in this eliasberg thurston type game is a solid torus neighborhood. Again, we need a gamma in a simple closed curve. Um, and again, we need to have at, you know, in the following sense attracting holonomy, we want to say that as we follow um, from along my gamma and get back to this point again, my interval has, has shrunk. I've got for some transversal H gamma of minus AB contained in minus CD open. Um, then we can get started. So it could be that all sorts of horrible non-attracting stuff is happening inside, but as long as we see one of these neighborhoods, we're in, we're in good shape. And Donjua tells us we can introduce those as many of the neighborhoods like that as we want. So step two is um, constructing contact regions on the solid torus neighborhoods. So if you have the Eliasberg Thurston picture, There's a nice way of introducing contact regions there. Um, if we have one of these attracting neighborhoods, we're sort of doing a combinatorial version of the smooths thing. So Eliasberg Thurston at each step need to have a confoliation. They need to have a smooth confoliation. At each stage, we need to have a smooth contact part and we need to have a continuous foliation part. They don't fit together nicely, um, but we, and, and in fact, we don't want them to fit together nicely. We need some extra wiggle room. And the extra wiggle room we get is by saying that we insist that when viewed from outside of this attracting region, the two-plane field um, is going to have larger or smaller, depending on what's your positive and negative slope, than the F. So we talk about we've got a flow that's giving us a notion of vertical. And we need to see this pattern because remember, we're going to eventually want the contact stuff to meet up with the foliation stuff. And that happens using this right-hand rule. So if my contact plane field looks like this, and I'm thinking Legendrian curve as I move vertically outwards, I get to match things up very nicely. OK, so this is back to Eliasberg thurston approach. So if you have enough good holonomy, then you have a transitive smooth confoliation. So transitive just means for every point in my manifold, there's a path in a leaf of the foliation from P to one of these contact solid tori. And so that's the beginning step. That was required an idea. This is just a standard thing. OK, now I can think about I've got paths, and I can cover my manifold by, um, open, by little rectangular box neighborhoods of each of these paths. And I can you know, play some sort of standard game where I have a smaller rectangular neighborhood whose closure is contained in the interior of a larger rectangular neighborhood. And the idea is to think when you're thinking about these rectangular neighborhoods of So we're thinking about we've started with sort of a contact portion over here. Remember, so we're contact on an open set. And over here, we're at whatever point in the Eliasberg-Thurston, we have a confoliation. 
So at the beginning, just think about we have a foliation. We've got the contact part, and it matches up and then becomes a foliation somewhere pretty close to this boundary right here. And we want to spread the contact stuff completely. So in Eliashberg Thurston, you're saying, OK, I'm very, so I can choose local coordinates so that I move in this direction. So as I move um, in a direction parallel to the y-axis, I'm thinking of those curves as corresponding to Legendrian curves. And I'm thinking in my standard model, I guess I've switched around the role of x and y, so maybe I want this to be x. But I can think about I've got contact part that very quickly becomes foliation part and just stays foliation part. So it's not too difficult to believe that instead of going from contact and then quickly becoming flat, I can choose to do this much more slowly. So that as I move along these curves, if you, you know, spend enough time to think back to standard models, um, I have contact on this whole region. So instead of going contact, so contact picture is if I can find sort of these coordinates where along one of the directions I've got, this is how the planes twist. So I'm thinking I've got contact, I twist very f quickly and then become flat. Instead, I think about twisting very, very slowly, so I need only become flat right here at the end and at the boundaries. So they radiate out the contact stuff. And then, of course, these boxes can crash into it, each other in horrible ways. Um, but you've got C1. Here they use the fact that the foliation is C1, so an openness of the contact condition to ensure that later perturbations are not going to destroy contactness on the stuff that's already been hit. And then we don't, of course, have c one nets, so we need to um, figure out a way to um, get around the problem that these boxes can crash into each other in ugly ways by just saying there's a decomposition, showing that there's a decomposition of the three manifold into boxes that do not intersect in horrible ways. So there are sort of some conditions you need the boxes to satisfy, and at each step, instead of having a smooth confoliation, Instead, you know, you've got a combinatorial game, so you need some sort of extra space to let you play your combinatorial game, have domination instead of matching up exactly. And then, you know, so it's the, but it's, you know, it's the same sort of idea. So um, more generalized notion of what we need for good holonomy, and then um, being more careful at how we spread out, uh, spread the contact stuff throughout the manifold. And here's a sort of overview of how the proof goes, and I'm mostly just putting that up on the screen um, for humor's sake. Mm -hmm. so, um, so thanks. <laughs>